did a fitness for a cop um, years ago. Uh, and, and the person finally got themselves into treatment and, uh, and the cop had said, you know, I'm not sure that I want to get into treatment. I'm not sure that it's, that it's safe, that it's really confidential. And his feeling was basically, I am less concerned about getting better than I am about nobody knowing I'm in therapy. He was more concerned about. I, I just, no one can know. So even if I go to therapy, I'm not going to tell you fitness for duty guy, because you're going to try to get my records. I'm less concerned about getting better. And this guy's life was falling apart around him. Absolutely falling apart. His job was falling apart. His marriage was falling apart. I'm less concerned about getting better than I am about nobody knowing I'm in therapy. Right. They, these are high stakes situations. Your average person going into therapy is not walking in there in a high stakes scenario. Right, your 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 tradesman, right, who has finally made the decision to go into therapy because he's on an ultimatum from his spouse or something like that. There's no high stakes scenario. They're not going to lose their job because they went into therapy. They're not going to lose their pension because they went into therapy and said something to the therapist. Right, your your average cop thinks they are. Right now, that's fantasy. It's not true. Ninety percent of the time, it's just not true. But, but they, they, they believe it is. The other, the other issue, one of the big barriers to treatment for cops is that they perceive, cops for the most part perceive mental health professionals as adversaries. The average person walking into a therapist office is not seeing the therapist as an adversary, right? Cops are. Hey, welcome back, everybody. I'm joined this time by Tom Coughlin. Tom grew up in New York City and actually comes from a family of cops. But some negative contacts as a kid left a bad taste in his mouth, let alone wanting to be a cop. So after high school, he went to college to study psychology. But when he got there, the coursework wasn't what he thought it was going to be. And so after graduation, he was working some odd jobs. And then a friend recommended a job with the New York City Parks Department. This eventually led to an almost 22 year career with the NYPD. While he was with NYPD, he got the opportunity to go back and get his doctor degree in psychology. And he started working with the Fit for Duty unit and then eventually the peer support program. He retired in 2019 and today he owns Blue Line Psychological Services where he's helping other first responders deal with their mental health and trauma from the job and he offers a unique perspective having been a cop himself. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation, so let's get into it. Here's episode 126 with Tom Coughlin. Let's start at the beginning. Where's hometown? Where'd you grow up? Uh, so I was born in Brooklyn and uh, raised in Queens. So uh, born in Brooklyn uh, and into Borough General Hospital, which is no longer there. And uh, we moved out of Brooklyn when I was real little i mean probably under a year and uh moved probably about a mile ago a mile away right over to queen's border and uh grew up in richmond hill queens family wise brothers sisters yeah i'm the youngest of three uh older brother is uh five years older than me and an older sister is four years older than me so uh they were the twins and then i came along a little later <laughs> what mom and dad do for work uh, dad worked for Con Edison for many years. He was actually a computer programmer. He wasn't on the, uh, you know, the electrical side of things, uh, but he was a computer programmer. Uh, prior than that, uh, worked at JFK as a cargo handler and some other things, but he was a computer programmer for Con Ed, probably about 30 to 30 some odd years. Uh, and then mom was primarily stayed at home, but she did some time working with payroll with a uh, payroll company. Um, but, uh, yeah, I sort of, um, Typical middle class Queens upbringing. What are your lines your dad work for throwing bags? Uh, good question. I don't know. I never asked him that. The only reason I ask is my dad worked for American Airlines and was at JFK. What years were your dad there? Oh, geez. It was right around when I was born. So probably 69, 68 to 72, so, somewhere around there. Kind of weird because that's my, so I was born in 69 also. My dad was working for American Airlines at the time. And then my mom was from California. And shortly after I was born, her mom passed away. 
and she wanted to go back home. So it's kind of weird. I wonder if our old man kind of crossed paths at, at certain times. It's a good question. I'll have to ask my dad that question. As far as you as a kid growing up, were you kind of troublemaker, good kid, good in school? No, I think I was a bit of an introvert as a kid. Um, uh, I spent a lot of time, if you're familiar with Queens at all, at least where I grew up in Richmond Hill, uh, Forest Park is kind of right there. Forest Park was actually a block away from my house. And uh, spent a lot of time just sort of out in Forest Park, which is kind of like a very woodsy, foresty kind of park square in the middle of uh, Queens. Spent a lot of time just sort of by myself out and about. Um, You know, it was different times. Uh, There was no cell phones. Nobody knew where we were or what we were doing for hours on end. Um, So I'd be out of the house, you know, at some point on a Saturday or Sunday, and I'd be out in the out in the woods in Forest Park and hanging out. But I was kind of an introverted kid. Uh, you know, I uh, wouldn't say so much of a nerd, but, you know, kind of comic books and computers, that that sort of thing. Sports uh, of an interest to you? Uh, it was always an interest. I was never been much of an athlete, really. Uh, I tried out for football in high school. My dad, my dad, my brother, uh, was, was a football player. He played through high school, and then he played uh, in college, and he had gotten scouted until he got mono and that kind of uh, – a wrench in that um but i always wanted to kind of follow in his footsteps in that way but he definitely got all the athlete genes uh, so i got <laughs> took I got, them all before you came along <laughs> yeah i got cut freshman year <laughs> high school so that wasn't gonna happen <laughs> now you eventually made your way into law enforcement but growing up did you have family or friends that were law enforcement you know i i did um but as much as i did i wouldn't say i came necessarily from a law enforcement family per se because uh so my mom's father, uh, my grandfather, who lived in the house with us and who I grew up with, he retired in 1972 and I was born in 1970. So I never knew him as a police officer. Uh, He was on the job 34 years from 1938 to 1972, but I was two years old when he retired. I, I knew he had been a police officer by the time I was, you know, old enough to know, but I never knew him as a police officer in that way. He kind of left the job behind him the day he left. So he wasn't one of these guys that was telling stories and had, you know, him in uniform around the house. There was exactly zero of that whatsoever. Right. So I had no exposure to that. His son, my uncle Frankie, died uh, a year before I was born or two years before I was born. My mom's uh, brother, he was uh, he'd, he had gone into the military, was in the Marines. He came back had stomach cancer after he came back and he died two years before I was born. He was on the job also. Um, I have pictures of him in uniform. I have all his records, but again, died before I was born. I never knew him. And so maybe that was a piece of why my grandfather retired quickly thereafter and just sort of never looked at the job again. Um, But so I came from law enforcement family, but I was not what I would say coming from a law enforcement family. It was never... Uh, part of my upbringing. As a matter of fact, some experiences that I had with with cops growing up left me with a really, really poor taste in my mouth for law enforcement whatsoever. You could say, I, I don't know if hated is the right word, but I had an extremely, extremely strong dislike for cops. I've had another guest who is a retired LAPD cop, but grew up in the Bronx. And he said the same thing. He said, the weirdest thing is growing up, I knew I wanted to be a cop, but at the same token, from his experiences with cops growing up, he hated them. Mm-hmm. But he also looked at it on the flip side and said, we were a bunch of young knucklehead kids. So, you know, they were treating us the way we treated them, you know, kind of deal. Yeah. When I was, I, I, I vividly remember I, I was young. I was probably eight or nine, something like that. So we grew up in Queens and there was some, some regular spots that my parents would kind of haunt. And, you know, by the time I was eight, my brother and sister were, you know, probably 12 and 13 at that point. So my parents had gone out. They were wherever, you know, they were getting dinner or something. And we had a home invader, um, you know, three kids and the home invader comes called 911, three kids alone in the house with a home invader. They didn't bother showing up. You know, it must've been two hours later. They finally wow. came knocking on the door. I really had no use for police whatsoever growing up. That one incident though, I mean, were, how were you guys able, would you, you and your brothers and sister just, we ran, ran, to, ran out of the house, eventually ran to a neighbor who came over with a baseball bat. Um, but you know, we could have been killed, right? And nobody cared. Nobody showed up. So. so coming to the end of high school, 
was law enforcement on your radar at this point? No, um, not at all. A um, couple more incidents similar, that kind of indifference in, among police. Uh, we had gotten, me and a couple of buddies had gotten jumped in Forest Park at one point. And, uh, you know, we called it in after and the cops showed up maybe 45 minutes later. They could care less. They could absolutely care less. Um, they didn't even want to take a report. You know, they just, they literally were completely and totally indifferent to it. Um, so no, I wanted nothing to do with law enforcement. Absolutely not. What were you thinking you were going to do after high school? Was college on your radar? Yeah. College was on my radar and I was really thinking mental health. I was thinking psychology, um, you know, specifically somewhere in the criminal psychology field. That was kind of what was on my radar. And, uh, and I, you know, did my undergrad in, in psychology. When you say criminal psychology, so was your interest in, ironically enough, even though you didn't have the let's say the need for police officers at that point was your desire to look and examine the mind of the criminal. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yes, to understand the mind, but also to be part of, um, I guess it always struck me that there was, uh, some leniency, a lot of leniency in the, in the system. Um, and I wanted to be part of, um, I guess sort of writing what I perceived as being a leniency, uh, in the system, you know, for, for offenders who, you know, plead not guilty by reason of insanity, whatever it might be. I mean, granted years later, you know, I would realize after doing some work in that field, I would realize I was, my perception was skewed. Um, but yeah, I wanted to be part of, um, doing right for society in regard to criminal psychology. Well, you graduate high school? 88. And straight into college? Yeah, straight into college. Where'd you end up going to college? I did a year at John Jay in my undergrad. And uh, honestly, that commute going out from Queens into the city just uh, got old really quickly. And so I did a year at John Jay and then I transferred to Queens College. And then I ultimately graduated from Queens College. I mean, it was, you know, a rock's throw from, from home. Did you stay into it to get into your grad program or was the transition to law enforcement at that point? You know, it's, it's funny. So... When, when you first start going into a professional field, especially something like mental health, I, I had no family that was in mental health. Like I, I had no advisors. I had no mentors at all whatsoever. I knew what I wanted to do in mental health. I knew that I wanted to be involved in mental health, but I knew nothing about the field whatsoever. So I go to Queens College, which is um, a predominantly behavioral system. So if you don't think behaviorally as a behavioral psychologist, you're really not a good fit Got it. for the program at Queens. I was not a good fit. I didn't know that, you know, until I was there and I was like, this isn't kind of how I think about things, but you don't understand theoretical orientations when you're in your undergrad and you don't really have anyone in the field to guide you. So what I didn't know was that I was in a program that was not a good theoretical fit for me. So I graduated with again, sort of a bad taste in my mouth for the field. And I was like, that was four years of really uninteresting stuff. And I don't think I want to do that anymore. An odd question. What's, what's the, the innate differences between, and, 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 am I, and classify them correctly into two schools of thought when it comes to psychology? So I would say there's probably primarily three, um, you know, large umbrella schools. You could say we have the cognitive and the cognitive behavioral people. We have the psychodynamic people. And then we could suggest that there's the humanistic people. Although some would suggest that the humanistic school is under the psychodynamic school. Where, what would have been the best for you to get into if you would have had better knowledge coming into it? I don't know what program like in particular, but a program that was psychodynamically oriented um, would have been for me. I mean, it was how I thought it was what interested me in, in, in psychology. Um, the cognitive behavioral approach, the CBT stuff, the DBT stuff, none of that interested me whatsoever. Um, I just didn't know anything about the field until I was in it. And then I said, wow, this is really not very interesting to me. Um, behavioral psychology is just not, it's not of interest to me. You know, I mean, I certainly, you know, I'm fairly fluent in it now, but, uh, as the way I practice and my theoretical orientation and my training is, is psychodynamic. Came to the end of that undergrad program. What was your plan at that point? Yeah. My plan was that I was done with college <laughs> and done with psychology and I wasn't doing that anymore. And then there was no plan. Um, I knocked around working in liquor stores, warehouses, um, retail stores, 
uh, whatever, valet, but car parking. You know, I worked as a valet for, for, for a while. So, you know, warehouses, liquor stores, car parking, retail stuff. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do for a living. Uh, I just knew that what I thought I wanted to do, in fact, I didn't find interesting whatsoever anymore. Um, so I knocked around for a few years, uh, not really having any clue what to do. I'd, uh, a buddy of mine that I grew up with in Queens had moved out to New Jersey uh, to work at a, a, a access door company out there in, in Jersey. Uh, and at some point, we were close, really, really close in high school. And at some point he said, you know, why don't you just come out and work with me? So I moved out to Jersey for a real brief period, um, lived with him in his apartment for a period of time then got my own place. And then, um, uh, uh, ultimately I, I decided, you know, that that wasn't a thing. I, he was in the front office. I was working in the warehouse. So, you know, again, the same thing, you know, liquor stores, warehouses, that, that kind of thing. Um, and then eventually, uh, I started where I got a, started working for, um, the parks department in New York city. Uh, a friend of mine, a close friend of mine from high school and a different friend of mine had said, Hey, there's this, he was interested in law enforcement and he said, Hey, there's this application for this city parks department job. It's like unarmed enforcement working in the New York city parks, which looking back is complete and total insanity <laughs> that, that, that you're unarmed, but enforcing the law in the parks in New York city. Uh, it's complete insanity, but, uh, you know, we took the job together. We went through the academy together in uh, in Queens. And from There's the, actually an academy for it. Yeah, there was an academy for it. Like, uh, maybe it was two or three months or something like that. It was um, uh, in Flushing Meadow Park over there. And uh, came out of that academy. And he got assigned to Queens. And, and frankly, because I've always, I know my flaws and I'm fairly oppositional. Um, and I think I was probably too oppositional during that academy. <laughs> He wound up in Queens, you know, five minutes from home, and they sent me over a bridge to the Bronx. So uh, I worked unarmed enforcement in the Bronx park system, um, which was a very interesting situation to be in, uh, telling people that really couldn't care less if you were an armed cop to do things and you're standing there in your green uniform with no gun and they know it. Uh, and that was an interesting period of time. I would imagine, though, that as weird as it sounds, it probably helped you develop your communication skills, your ability to talk to somebody to either de-escalate a situation or to get what you needed to get done, because that's pretty much all you had. You had your command presence and your ability to talk to people. Yeah, it's really all you had. Um I remember I was assigned to, uh, for a period of time to the Van Cortland pool, if you're familiar with the Bronx, Van so every, every borough has its sort of flagship park. Um, so I got assigned to Van Cortland park in the Bronx working the pool. Um, you know, hottest days of the summer, everybody's out in the pool. Uh, people, you know, knuckleheads want to cause trouble and, and all sorts of things. And the only thing you have is a radio on your hip, um, and, and your gift of gab. Uh, and so it developed there. I worked in St. Mary's Park in the pool there as well. And if anyone knows St. Mary's Park uh, in the South Bronx, it's it's not a place to be working with no gun and trying to enforce the law. I mean, I, I remember um, it's a story I tell my kids and we kind of laugh about it now, but there was, you have to, you kind of have to know this, the Bronx, but I'm working at this pool. Real quick, what year are we talking about? Oh, 93. 92, 93, probably 93, um, working at a pool in the South Bronx and, you know, things go on. This kid decides, kid, he's, you know, a teenager, young teenager, decides he wants to start riding his bicycle in the pool. So takes his bike in the pool, you know, it's all sorts of problems, you know? So I say to him, I said, you know, dude, take the bike out of the pool, man. You got little kids here. And he stood up and reached into his waistband and pulled out a gun and told me, I'll kill you right here. And I said, look, do me a favor. Just take the bike out of the pool. My boss comes here. At least tell him I told you to take the bike out of the pool so I don't get in trouble. That's all I really care about, all right? And it was like, whatever, whatever. He blew me off. But, you know, you're standing there unarmed getting a gun pulled on you in the South Bronx for telling <laughs> someone to take a bicycle out of the pool. You start to say, I need to find another job. The percentage of 
knuckleheads, rule breakers, whatever you want to refer to them as, hanging out in the pools compared to the good families and stuff, just trying to have, let their kids have a place to play. What ratio are we talking about? Is th- yeah, it's about the same percentage as the rest of the population, right? You get, and I don't know, this is an arbitrary number, you get 80% of good people out there. So know? for the most part, it was families just trying to enjoy a hot summer. It's just a few bad apples so to speak yeah you know 20 percent of the population causing trouble for the other 80 percent basically around that how long did you end up doing that job for uh not long um probably i got i got um uh, i took the exam for postal police and uh, i got hired by postal police in mid no early 96 so i probably did that until 95 or so there was a period of time where i left that Went to work with my buddy back in the warehouse and then got called for postal police, uh, which I, so I was probably there total, maybe two years at the parks job. Um, and then got hired by postal police in uh, April, April 96. Going back to as a kid in, in the first quote unquote bad interaction with the with law enforcement not coming to your house and now working as a park police officer. Did you have any interactions with law enforcement especially as an adult that were positive, obviously I'm I'm assuming you interacted with some in your job as a park police officer, but just maybe off duty or before you ever started doing that. Not off duty. No, I had no friends who were cops. I didn't know anybody who was a cop. Um, The only interaction I had uh, really was at work in that parks gig. Uh, Cause you know, there's cops that kind of patrol the parks, but then there's also during the summers, there were cops assigned to the pools, you know, so they'll come in and pop in and check on things. And you'd, you know, you'd chat and talk and things like that. There were some positive interactions there, but I had nobody in my social circle that was a cop. Applied for the postal police. How'd that process go or what ended up happening with that? You know, I tell you, you people, you know, my, people might say postal police, you know, what exactly are you doing? You know, uh, that was a good job. I, I, I really enjoyed that job. Um, I was stationed at JFK uh, in the postal facility there and granted, yes, you're police, right? You lock up your firearm at work. You can't take it home. Right. So you're only a police officer on postal property. Right. So you have to lock up your firearm at work at the end of your tour. You take it back out at the beginning of your tour. Um, and primarily what you're doing is really in a certain way, security, for postal facilities, right? So I I worked midnights. Uh, I worked midnights for many years throughout my career in general, but I worked midnights. And so if a post office alarm went off at three in the morning, you know, you were jumping in the car, grabbing a shotgun uh, and heading out to the postal facility to check the alarm and see what was going on. Um, On site at JFK, really a large piece was uh, protecting postal facilities there de-escalating issues between postal employees <laughs> on site, which happens frequently or did at the time anyway. And also, um, you know, without going into specifics, um, certain shipments come in in the middle of the night, three, four o'clock or so middle of the night. And then you go out to those aircrafts and you protect that property coming in. And then you rot when it transports into a truck, you, you escort that property uh, to where it's going. Uh, so, so, so there was some of that as well. Um, the guys who'd been there a long time wanted nothing to do with any of that. They didn't want to do the transport for the property. Um, you know, it's, it's very valuable material. Right. And it's you with a shotgun. And so nobody wants to do that, <laughs> you know? So I wound up doing that quite a lot. Um, nobody wanted to do the call outs to the postal facilities to go check on alarms. I wound up doing a lot of that. Um, so granted, was I out enforcing the law? Was I answering radio runs? No, it was none of that whatsoever. Um, but it was exposure to the field. It was, you know, being in a uniform gun on your hip out there, you know, doing, doing what you do. So it was sort of that next step up from sort of unarmed parky to, you know, armed postal cop. When you're at work, you're a postal cop, right. you know, um, the pay was terrible. Uh, I mean, at the time I'm trying to think this is 96, I think it was 30, 32,000 a year, I think was something like that. Um, it was still a step up from the pay I had in parks. Um, 
And for me, it was my first sort of like real job in a certain way. Right. I know, you know, the city job was good, but this was sort of a different step. Um, and you're a government age, uh, employee at this point, right? You're, you're a postal employee. You're not considered federal. Not in the GS rating? Right, correct. So later, like if I wanted to apply to federal positions later on, and it would say, have you ever been a federal employee in the past? Technically, the answer is no. Got it. Because uh, you're a postal employee, not a, not a federal employee. Um, and I did that for a year. The best part of that job, and I, and I did like the job. I didn't dislike it. Um, the best part of that though, was the training at Fletzy. Um, it was a three month, you know, sleep away camp, uh, training at Fletzy. Um, it was fantastic training. It was mixed, mixed, basic police training class 612. I think I was in, um, and it was fantastic training. Fletzy was amazing. Um, we were down there mixed, basic police. So we were there with like treasure, mint and treasury cops and uh, a whole bunch of sort of smaller agencies that sent smaller groups. And when we were down there, customs had their own thing. They did their own thing, but being down there at Fletzy, um, you know, three months down there in Glynn County doing all of that. Uh, you know, we ran every day through the Georgia swamp. Um, we shot, I mean, I, I, I want to say every day, but we shot many days down there and they trained you to shoot. They trained you to be a marksman, you know, low light, no, no light, bright light, heavy noise, no noise, you know, various situations. They trained you to be proficient with your weapon. Unlike frankly, the NYPD Academy, which trains you to hit a paper target so you can pass your qualification test so they can send you out to the street. Right. Fletzy trains you to be a marksman. And, and I, I never shot a gun before that in my life. Um, and by the time I left there, I was, I was proficient. I remember having a, a range instructor when I was in the academy, old Vietnam guy. And he goes, yeah. It, and, and he would, he would just could shoot phenomenally well. And I remember one time, you know, upside down with his pinky and still shot a 300. <laughs> and he goes, yes, 30 rounds in the same hole. They give you the maximum points. He goes, in a real life situation, turn them into Swiss cheese. Why do you want 30 holes in the same spot? Put different holes in them in different parts of their body, you know? So the different mindset. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more it, of a battle mindset. Yeah. You know, in the sense of, yeah, you could shoot through a paper target and put all 30 holes in this little circle and, and everybody will think you're a great shooter. Mm -hmm. But what does that translate to in the real world? Right. Because after you've put the third or fourth round in that same spot, you're not doing any more damage. <laughs> it's a fair point. The... Could you have used the postal police position as a springboard to a postal investigator spot? Yeah. So, um, postal inspection, uh, would sometimes recruit from the postal. In other words, they would market, you know, and, and, and recruit. Um, I did put in, I can't remember the process at the time. I don't remember if it was an application or a resume. I don't remember the exact process. I did put in for postal inspection, but I got called by the city before I got, you know, called or really even before my, uh, background investigation really got going for postal uh, inspection. So the city just came first and, and that's where I went. Do you remember your mindset switch as far as, as a young, young boy, a young man, not really, and I'll loosely call it liking police to where it actually was something that you wanted to do as opposed to, uh, it's just a job. I'll give it a shot. Yeah. So when I, when I first came on the city with the parks department with, with my buddy, it, it was still to me just a knock around job. I had no intention that that was going to be a long-term job, you know, and, and quite frankly, and I'm not, this is not to be disparaging or demeaning in any way. Once I was on that job, I realized, yeah, I'm not, I, this is, I'm not doing this long-term. Right. Um, and then I went to postal and I saw that there was a way to sort of say, wow, I can still do more with this line of work. Right. Um, but I think it was, it was really my experiences. I think, you know, truthfully, I think it was the bonding that went on at Fletzy more than anything with, with my fellow cohort members. It was the bonding that went on there and hearing a lot of stories from them about, they did have relatives in law enforcement. They did have social circles in law enforcement, which I never had. I think it was really the bonding that went on at Fletzy that in my mind sort of said to me, you know, I think law enforcement is something that I, that I want to do. 
Um, so that was really the piece, I think, that made Because it wasn't until after FLETC that I really started taking other exams or putting in other applications. Yeah, so when did you come on with NYPD? April 15th, 1997. And coming into that big of an organization with all of the potential opportunities, what were you kind of thinking you wanted to kind of stick your feet in and, and get into? You know, I from early on, my intention was to want to go through the ranks. Um, so by that time, um, I by that time, my, my, my wife and I were, were, were together. We weren't married at that time, but we had been together and um, her uncle uh, was a lieutenant on the job at the time. And so, um, I had come to know him and, and, and saw myself wanting to aspire to go through the ranks in, in that way. Uh, I failed the sergeant's exam and then just sort of never looked back at that. Um, so in my head, I really, but well, I guess, I guess I'm not ranking up. I mean, I could have taken another exam. That wasn't a problem, but, um, I don't know if that disillusioned me to it or just made me, you know, kind of discouraged about it. Uh, but early on, my intention was to want to go through the ranks and rank up. In the late 90s or, or mid 90s, with a bachelor's degree, were you the abnorm at NYPD or did a lot of guys already have a, a bachelor's? Lot of, a lot of people already had. I think at that by that time, the college requirement was already in place. OK, so you had to have at least 60 credits to to get on or some relevant substitution like the military or whatever else they might have had a substitution. Um, so you had to have at least 60 credits, you know, an associate's degree worth to, to get in. Um, many, many people had, had, uh, had degrees at that time. Did you get to, or did you want to work many of the boroughs or did you want to be back in Queens? I really wanted to be back in Queens. You know, I wanted to be close to home and that was my first command was in Queens, um, which I loved, you know, Queens Marines and, and I know all the jokes about Queens Marines and everything else, but I just, I loved being there. I don't normally make it a, a, a raw, raw podcast, but you obviously experienced nine 11. Yeah. What was that impact like for you? Were you on duty that day? So, you know, it's, uh, I was supposed to be on duty that day. Um, that was a Tuesday I was, I had Saturday, Sunday RDOs at that time. I was working down at one PP and I had Saturday, Sunday RP, RDOs. And my son was, let's see, this was 2001, 99. My son was three at the time. Um, and it was, it was going on three and, and he, um, you know, 99 would have gone. So he was enrolled in like a, like a daycare kind of thing. Right. It was going to start that Tuesday was his first day. So I banged in administrative sick Monday and Tuesday. Um, administrative sick is, so if you call in regular sick, you got to go see the district surgeon and maybe they'll give you the week off. Maybe they won't. If you call an admin sick, you don't have to justify it to anybody. You don't have to bring a doctor's note. You don't have to go see the district surgeon. They just give you two days off. Right? So I banged in that Monday, Tuesday sick so that I could be there when my son left for, um, for that first day. And, uh, so I, I was not on that day. Well, I was supposed to be on, but I had banged in sick. And so, uh, my wife was on the job at the time also. And, uh, that morning we were in the house, sort of a happy morning, you know, taking pictures with my son, first day of school clothes and the whole thing, you know, and, uh, my mother-in-law didn't live far from where we lived. And so we were going to stop over there first so they could take pictures and then drop them off and uh, do whatever. My mother-in-law called the house, um, you know, not long after the first plane hit, she called the house and she said, talking to my wife, she said something like, Oh, did you hear, you know, there's a plane hit the world trade center. And I could recall my wife saying down the hall, uh, you know, my mom says a plane just hit the world trade center. I'm thinking it's like a Cessna or, or one of these like freak accidents that go on. And I remember being like completely indifferent to it. I remember going, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's cool. Let's, let's go. We have to get him to school. Come on, let's go. We, we're running late. We have to go. Um, was completely kind of indifferent to it because I was in the middle of this, you know, really to me, really important moment in my family, um, packed him up, got him into the car, drove to, uh, my mother-in-law's and that's when the second plane hit. Um, and then that's when like the rest of the world, that's when we knew that we were, we were under attack at that point, you know? Um, and so, no, I was not on, but 
we were standing there watching it and uh, threw my son in the car, flew over to the school, dropped him off. And then my wife and I just got back in the car and we just went straight into the city from there. I was out sick. Technically, I was not supposed to be going in, but we just jumped in the car. Both of us, we had no uniform parts or anything like that. We just flew into the city. Um, we were we were living upstate at the time. We were up in Orange County at the time. And uh, we hit the Palisades. I must have done, I don't know, I was probably doing 120, 130 miles an hour going down the Palisades at a clip. The state troopers had every exit blocked by that point. Nobody was coming on. Nobody was getting off at that point. State troopers were at every exit, blocking, blocking, blocking. And it was just, it was, it was deserted. I, I must have done the Palisades Parkway from exit 17 to the bridge in, I don't know, but under 10 minutes, maybe. I, I, I mean, it was ridiculous. How what would a normal time be? Average? Yeah, probably half an hour or so, okay. something like that, you know? Um, I just flew and when we, when we hit the GWB and everything was locked down, there wasn't a car on the road and the GWB was just wide open. Um, and we flew over the bridge and we look off to the right and all we see is the smoke coming up over the city. And we didn't know what we were driving into. You know, there was no information coming out at that point. We didn't know what we were driving into, but we hit the West side highway and that was closed. And we just flew down that chute got down to one PP and, uh, you know, got in and just started working for those not familiar with the city or NYPD. One police plaza is basically your headquarters, correct? Yes. Yeah. In relation to the towers, what's the separation? What's the distance? Oh, I, it's a five minute walk. You know, I, I used to, I might, I used to take the train to work, um, take mass transit from Orange County, you shoot down on the Metro North and then you come over on either the path train or, or how, you know, the, the ferries, the other option. I used to take the path train from Jersey um, and I would take it into World Trade. So the path train used to come in, I don't know, maybe it still does, I haven't been on it in years, but the path train used to come into the deep sub-basement of the World Trade Center. And the train that I would take used to hit World Trade at something like I don't know, 837 or something like that. And uh, then I would have a like a 23 minute, you know, time frame to get to one PP, which I didn't need 23 minutes. I needed like five minutes to get to one PP. So there used to be a Borders books and music on the second floor. And I used to go up to Borders and I used to sit there and grab a coffee and read the paper for a minute and then and then walk over. So, you know, I know it's one of these coulda, shoulda, woulda kind of questions. But had I not banged in that Tuesday to be with my son um, I would have pulled in at 837 uh, and gone up. And then the first plane was, what, 8, 848? Um, so I would have been I would have been in the building uh, at the time. Granted, not on the 80th floor. Right. Uh, but who knows? Maybe I would have, you know, just thrown my shield on. Because I was in suit and tie. Maybe I would have just thrown my shield on my on my jacket and just started working. Who knows? Um, but uh, we won't know, right? <laughs> what kind of assignment were you working on 1PP? Yeah, so I... Um, I was working at uh, the research office of the personnel bureau. So the personnel is based at the time, it's basically all, all things, human resources. And at the time training also the Academy no longer falls underneath personnel, but it did at the time. So we had anything training fell under personnel and anything human resources fell into personnel. My wife's uncle um, was in his whatever, however many years he was on the job at the time. And he was finishing his time up at working at the Academy and research and development at the Academy. And a lot of the folks he came up with were working in personnel at one PP. And so he had reached out and said, Hey, you know, you know, have any positions open? And uh, one of his friends over there did. And, and I got an interview and I went down there and was primarily doing research, um, research uh, work down, down at one PP in personnel. Going back to when you came on, they didn't waive the academy requirement because you'd gone to Fletzy, correct? No, no, nothing like that at all. Would does NYPD have any type of academy waiver for anybody coming in with law enforcement experience? No, I've never heard of anything like that. So you always, no matter who you've worked for prior, if you're coming to NYPD, you have to go back yeah. through their academy. Yes. And how many weeks is it or how many months is it? I think it was six months at the time. Um, yeah, six months. I came on in April 15th and we graduated the academy two days before Halloween. So April 15th to October 20. 
9. Is it a live in or come in in the morning, go home in it's, the afternoon? It's uh, commuting. And ultimately, you did how many years? Uh, 21 with the NYPD. And retired in what year? 2018. Were you going down the avenue or did you start bringing in the mental health component at all while you were still working? Yeah. Um, so one of the reasons that, that I took the, or looked for the opportunity to interview, you know, to, to, to get off patrol at the time. And I, I loved patrol. I loved the work of patrol. I didn't like everything that came with it, meaning the unpredictability, you know, the getting flown around the city, you know, getting your tours changed constantly because I was going back to school. So I went back to my master's. I, I went back to John Jay for my master's in forensic psych in uh, 99, I want to say. A couple of years after I got on the job, I went back for my master's. And I was doing it slowly. You know, it was 36 credit program. I was doing it slowly. Um, and I had a training sergeant who knew that I was going back to school. I was working midnights. Um, and I was in, the, by this point, I'd started in the 108. By this point, I was in the 2-0 on the Upper West Side. And I had a training sergeant there who, I don't know what the issue was. I'm still not really sure. Um, didn't really care about what your needs are or whether or not you're going back to school. Really didn't care. And would constantly give me training slips on the one day of the week that I had classes stacked. Um, and knew it and just kept hitting me with training on that day. Um, and I was like, I can't. I can't do this anymore. You know, I'm, I'm trying to achieve this thing and this guy does nothing but, but hinder me the entire way for really no reason that I was aware of. So I started looking around for other opportunities and where can I go off patrol with not a lot of time on the job. And, uh, and that's when my wife's uncle, you know, connected me with that, with that interview down there. So the reason I, I look to get off patrol is because I needed more predictability in my schedule. I needed to get away from this guy who wouldn't right. stop just, hammering me with training notifications on the one day that I had classes. Uh, and so I, I, I did that. So I was already in my master's for forensic psych by the time I went down, uh, went downtown. Was there something specific once you got on the job that pushed you towards going back towards your master's or just simply that was in your long-term game plan that you knew you wanted to get education wise, you wanted to get to an end result. Yeah. I, I became kind of a cop by accident, you know? Um, what I really wanted was, was to get my psychology degree. Ultimately I wanted, I wanted my doctorate. Um, but like I said, I had such a bad taste in my mouth from Queens, from the, the program at Queens, not from, not from the college itself, but from just not being a good fit for the program at Queens, um, that I decided I really don't want to do that anymore. When I got back on the job, I think I started seeing more of the criminal justice side of things and that kind of reignited my passion for wanting to be in that criminal psychology realm. And so I looked around at, at what other programs existed and I started going back for my master's in forensic psych at John Jay, which was, you know, ironically enough is where I started my undergrad and then transferred to Queens, wound up back there um, and did my master's graduated. I was, I was there still for nine 11 graduated. I want to say September 2001 or May, 2001, somewhere around there. It was 2002. I'd have to look back, but um, John Jay, not so much John Jay, but forensic psychology is a, is a, is a, is sort of a, uh, an anomaly within the field because where in many other programs, it's theoretically based. So this program is cognitively based. This one is behaviorally based. Forensic psychology doesn't work like that. Forensic psychology is about applying the study of human behavior specifically to the court system, right? It's just about applied work. That's all it is. So forensic psychology is a theoretical. It's completely a theoretical. So it doesn't matter if you're psychodynamic or cognitive or behavioral, just get the job done, right? This is about doing assessments uh, and other services within the forensic realm. Um, when I started at John Jay and it became apparent that there's no theoretical basis that you didn't have to think this way theoretically or that way theoretically, um, it was a breath of fresh air in the field. And that time in my master's sort of reignited my passion for the field because I realized, oh, so I don't, I don't have to think this way theoretically in order to be in the field. Um, and that's kind of what really 
reignited my passion, not only in the field, but also wanting to go on uh, for my doctorate once I graduated. With a grad degree, is there many options for work that, and it's a two-part question, are there a lot of options for work? And two, were those options ever considered to pull you away from the law enforcement career at that point? No, with with a master's, there's, there's limited options in the field. Really, there, there are options, but you're never independent as well. Now, so let me back up. So my master's was a master's of arts, right? And it was not a master's in a licensable degree. Now, if you got a, a master's as like an LMSW, a licensed um, uh a, a, a licensed social worker, a licensed clinical social worker, or even now they have masters in forensic health counseling where it can lead to a master's level licensure. The degree I got was not a licensure, not licensure eligible degree. So I graduated with a master's, but couldn't do anything with it per se in the field because it didn't, um, it wasn't eligible to apply for licensure. For you, was it merely just the next step towards getting a doctor degree? Yeah, my undergrad grades, frankly, were awful. Um, I think I graduated with like a 2.6 GPA out of my undergrad. I just had no passion for it. I didn't enjoy right. it. I didn't like being there. Um, and my GPA reflected that, you know, I was happy to just pass. Um, so I graduated with like a 2.6 GPA. No doctorate program is picking you up with a 2.6 GPA. They're, they're just not. There's too much competition out there. Right. So really, the master's was in part about grade inflation, about demonstrating maturity and demonstrating grade inflation, which it did. I was like, you know, I don't remember what it was, but my, my GPA was pretty close to a four. It wasn't a four, but it was pretty close. So to show that degree of grade inflation within like four years or so, however many years it was, um, was really what I wanted to be able to apply, you know, for, for the doctor program. So yeah, it was, it was a step. It was, it was sort of a long-term plan of how do I, um, do damage control for the damage I did to myself, uh, you know, screwing around in college for, for four and a half years and not really caring. <laughs> there are a lot of factors that are coming into play. You got your undergrad degree right out of high school. So you're dealing with the, the maturity, immaturity thing, not applying yourself. You've got the gap to where between finishing your undergrad and starting your grad degree, you're working, you're on the job, you've got a family. How was that balance trying to go back to school? Because for, for a lot of people today, it's all online. So you just do it at home at three o'clock in the morning, get your assignments done, but you were doing it all in person. So that balancing aspect of work, family, and school, how did that impact your desire to keep continuing with education? In, you know, in, in the NYPD, and I don't know if other law enforcement agencies use this language, probably not, I would think. It's probably an NYPD specific term. Um, and it is, it's, an, it's NYPD. PD jargon, right? So, you know, uh, we, when we talk about having a rabbi in the NYPD, it means that you have somebody in your corner who's of some degree of authority or rank or power, and they're kind of a mentor and they're sort of looking out for you and they have an interest in your career and they want to help you move through your career. So, um, at the time, so I, I, I had a rabbi at the time and I had some mentors at the time. Um, and if it wasn't for those folks, so I, I guess the first step is going back when I was on patrol and t trying to do my master's. This particular training sergeant was, was going to cause me to fail the program. He, he was just going to, there was no way about it. I, I had missed three consecutive weeks of classes because he refused to just stop hitting me with training. That's what led me to want to get off patrol, right? Um, I had, I needed more predictability. It was then, and then it was through my wife's uncle that I was able to connect to do that. So that was sort of my first kind of, you know, rabbi for lack of a better term. Um, and then once I got to 1PP, um, that's where I made a lot of the connections and really developed the friendships and the mentors that helped me get through my doctorate training because I also did that while working full time. And so um, if it wasn't, frankly, if it wasn't for people who along the way helped me or opened a particular door or suggested I do this or suggested I do that or tried to guide my career in a certain way, I, I don't know that I probably never would have made it through that, even the master's degree. The decision to do a doctorate, did it 
do you continue on straight after grad school or was there a gap? There was a gap because I got rejected by numerous programs before I finally got in. So I started applying to, to doctor programs. So I graduated in 2002. I started applying to doctor programs immediately. But when I graduated, it was too late to get into the fall 2002. So the earliest classes I could apply for was the fall 2003 programs. Um, I submitted lots of applications for fall 2003, got rejected by everyone. Submitted lots of applications for fall 2004, got rejected by everyone. And then, um, I guess speaking of mentors, when I was at John Jay, um, a couple of professors really um, were, I mean, I consider them mentors, you know, and some of them I still keep in touch with. Uh, the first was Dave Halperin, who was a psychiatrist, actually, who specialized in cults. And um, Dave was, was a mentor to me. He helped me get my first publication uh, in the Cultic Studies Journal at the time. Dave passed away not long after that. Um, Lou Schlesinger, who uh, later became a colleague when I went to be an adjunct at John Jay, interestingly enough. Uh, Lou is amazing, uh, does a lot of criminal profiling work and, and criminal psychology work. But then really the most important was Naftali Burrell. Um, if you watch any of these true crime shows, you've seen Naftali Burrell. You just might not know that you've seen him in these crime shows. Um, he's all over the place. He has a forensic practice that is in Brooklyn, is in Great Neck, and I think maybe an office in Manhattan as well. I took a class with Naftali during my master's and just really saw him as a mentor. And so when I was getting rejections, 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 I called Naftali up and I said, can we, can we sit down and talk? And he said, absolutely come down to the office. And I went out to Brooklyn um, and we sat down and, and we talked. And I think the best piece of advice he gave me was all of these programs that you're applying for, why are you so focused on applying for a PhD program as opposed to a PsyD program? Why are you so focused on that? And in my mind, it was, well, because that's what you need to be legitimate in the field. It has to be a PhD program. It can't be a PsyD program, you know, not if you want real legitimacy in the field. And he said, look, he said, look, ultimately, you're going to graduate from somewhere with a doctorate in psychology. And it, regardless of what field of psychology or what degree you graduate with, you're going to have a doctorate in psychology. And when it's on your wall, and it says you've graduated, your degree is going to look like everybody else's degree. So whether you get a PhD in industrial organizational psychology or social psychology, or you get a PsyD in clinical psychology, you're still a psychologist. And then you write your ticket from there, right? So I took a lot of um, information back from Natalia, and then I expanded my, my, um, my search for where to apply. And uh, I applied to uh, Yeshiva University to their uh, clinical psychology PsyD program um, and got accepted. No issues get through that program while still being on the job as well, far as time management and, and being able to get classes into your work schedule. If it if it weren't for for mentors, there's no way it could have been done. Um, I was working. I was still working at one PP when I started. I started in fall 2005. I was still working up in personnel, but I needed a lot of adjustments to my tours because it just wasn't going to work. It, it wasn't really working for them either. Kind of the way I was adjusting my tour and the way I was flexing hours and not always being available. It wasn't really working for them either. Right. But I'd been there a long time. I got promoted there. Um, they didn't necessarily want to see me go, right? They had promoted me. You kind of owe them time at that point. And they were my mentors. You know, they were my friends. Um, but they said, look, it's, it's not really working. We want to support you, but this is not really working for either one of us, I don't think. So they helped me get uh, a position on midnights at the outdoor range. Uh, so I wasn't a range instructor. I was on the security um, detail at the outdoor range and I did midnights and I sat in this little security booth for eight hours doing security up at the outdoor range with my laptop open and books spread across in front of me. I would do midnights in the Bronx at the outdoor range and Yeshiva's psychology program is in the Bronx. So then I would just go from the range right off work. I'd go straight to school. I'd be in classes probably till, you know, three, four in the afternoon um, and drive back home get a few hours sleep, see my kids and do it again. And did that for five years. Wow. 
the coming to the end of that program, what was your long term aspirations with the degree, and how did that tie into the years you had left on the job? Was it something where as soon as you had your doctor degree, you were looking for your step out, or was it something that you kind of like, well, let me see where it kind of goes? Yeah, no, I, I had no plan for retirement. When I say no plan, I mean, I had no intention to retire whatsoever. I, I wanted to stay on the job long term. Um, so I graduated in 2010. And then again, through the help of mentors and, and people, and I, 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 I have no qualms admitting that I'm only where I am today because people made phone calls when necessary. People called in airstrikes for me and took care of situations for me. And, 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 and to, I have no qualms at admitting I was golden parachuted places. I had rabbis protect me probably at times when I didn't deserve it. Um, that's sort of how I got by. Right. Um, when I graduated in 2010, I was transferred to the medical division to uh, the psychological uh, evaluation section at the medical division. Uh, I didn't have my, my hours for licensure yet, so I wasn't licensed, but I was getting my licensure hours and sort of double dipping being that I was working and getting my licensure hours at work at the same time. So I was, uh, got my license in July, 2013. So it takes about two years to get your licensure hours, uh, completely. So from 2010 to 2012, I was getting my licensure hours, then applied for licensure exam and got licensed in 2013. Uh, on the first try, I have no idea how I did that because I left the licensure exam and sat in my car and cried because I was pretty sure that I'd bombed that that exam completely um passed it on the first shot uh was licensed at that point and then it's it, the work there so i was doing fitness for duty evaluations primarily um the work there can be frustrating because the cop is not your client the department is your client and so push comes to shove you are always going to prioritize the best interest of the department always because the department's your client right you're going to do ethically you're going to do everything that you need to do you know in that sense you're going to have the best interest of the cop but ultimately the department's your client right that was frustrating to me um seeing sometimes organizationally how things were done and finding them to be unjust at times and unfair at times at the time still what i wanted to do was criminal psychology. I still wanted to work with offenders. I still wanted to do dangerousness assessments. That's really all, everything I wanted to do. Um, ultimately, long-term, that wouldn't work out because of state regulations regarding pensioners and things of that nature. Um, but that's really what I wanted to do. And so I, was, uh, I went straight to psych in 2010. And... Uh, was but it was a, a mutually beneficial arrangement because it allowed you to get your clinical hours, but at the same time, NYPD was able to leverage your degree as an employee? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I was the only... So there have been other uniform psychologists on the department before me. Um, we can go back to Harvey Schlossberg. We can go to Greg Mack, who was my predecessor uh, uh, there. Um, Greg is now deputy director of psyche valves. Um, curiously enough, he went out, did his own thing, came back as deputy director. Now, uh, I worked with Greg. He was a detective there. I was a detective there. Um, and so, yeah, I was the only uniform psychologist there. There was a whole staff of psychologists, but they were all civilians. When does the or was there a significant moment that caused you to want to start working with officers and first responders from the mental health component? The things that I saw done during my time at Psyche Val, the injustices, the, um, the lack of compassion towards cops who were truly suffering and truly needed help and were only being seen through a fitness for duty lens. Um, colleague of mine, Lou Schlosser, he's a, um, a police psychologist out in Jersey, out in Oakland, uh, a colleague of mine who does primarily, so he does primarily only fitness for duty, but his company does pre-employment, but he exists in the assessment realm. He does fitness for duties and, and, and pre-employments. Um, he has a particular way of looking at fitness for duty evaluations, that they should be a constant feedback loop through wellness programming as well. 
right? If you're going to do fitness for duty evaluations and, and lose philosophy, and I agree with them, you should be making treatment recommendations as well. It's not good enough to just say to an agency, your cop is unfit. Well, now what? I mean, what is what good does that do the cop? And what good does that do the agency who's just invested 15 years of training in this person? So he's unfit, but, but now what, doc, right? Most people doing fitness for duty evaluations do not make treatment recommendations. They just say fit or unfit. That does the cop no good. That does the agency no good. So Lou's philosophy is that it should all be a feedback loop through wellness, and I happen to agree with him. That's not how it was being done in the NYPD at the time when I was there. Um, I would imagine that lends itself for a pretty wide gray area in the sense that you cross the line, they say you're fit, but that officer may still need some mental health or psychiatric evaluation. On the other side, they could, they could hit the box for unfit, but it's like, if we just give them this little bit, they'll be fit. Yeah, you know, here's the thing with, with, with fitness for duties, right? You know, you, you can kind of lie your way through them, right? Uh, and these are high stakes scenarios. Your job is literally on the line. Your pension is on the line. To either be separated on a psych disability, an ordinary psych disability, not a three quarters, an ordinary psych disability, you're going to get 50% taxed of your, of your, of, 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 of your pension. You know I mean, what's that going to do you, especially if you've only got nine years on the job, right. what's 50% of nothing, nothing. Right. So it's a high stakes scenario for these cops. So are they going to sit there and be open and honest when they know the psychologist sitting over there, that psychologist client is the department that's psych- like, I am not that psychologist client. That psychologist is going to prioritize the department's need and is going to, can only make decisions as whatever the department decisions allow it to make. Right. And so cops are going to go into a fitness for duty and, you know, I mean, yeah, anybody put in that kind of high stakes scenario where, you know, I'm going to take your job, they're going to go in guarded, they're going to go in evasive and they're going to conceal things. Right. What's the point What is the point of monitoring somebody six months to a year on a restricted duty capacity to do a fitness for duty evaluation and that person to walk in to see you every month or whatever it is? Yes, no. Yes, no. Maybe so. Yes, no. No, I'm good, doc. I'm fine. Everything's great. Thanks very much. They're not going to be open with you. They're not going to be honest with you. They're not going to go to treatment because if they go to treatment, you're going to make them sign a release of authorization. And now they're going to go to your therapist and they're going to get your records. So you're going to, they say, go to treatment and now you go to treatment and now they're going to, what are you going to be honest with your therapist? No, you're not going to be honest with your therapist because you know, the agency is going to get your records and pour through everything that you said. So you're going to go to treatment because you have to quote unquote, and then you're going to lie to your therapist too. Right? So the whole way it's done doesn't in any way encourage wellness, psychological wellness at all. Um, there should be a whole different way of doing the whole process, right? But the agency, it's not just the NYPD, many agencies are not good at change, right? Organizational change, procedural change, they're just not good at it. And so the th- to answer your question, the things that I saw done those four years that I was at psych doing fitness for duties and not just fitness for duties, disciplinary stress triage. So as a guy gets jammed up, he gets suspended, he gets returned from suspension and modified. He has to speak to one of the department psychologists. So you're doing these disciplinary stress triages. You're doing critical incident response. Um, you're doing special assignment, uh, assessments like undercover, uh, assessments, things like that. There's a variety of other responsibilities you have as well, but primarily where, what, where I was, was fitness for duty evaluations. Some of the decisions I saw made, And some of the things I saw done, I felt were unjust and in certain times completely unethical. Um, And that was part of what shifted me to saying, you know, I see what's being done to my brothers and sisters and it's wrong and it's unjust, it's unhelpful, and in some cases unethical. And and I want to do something to try to right this. Were you able to implement any types of changes within NYPD while you were there? No. so the only thing, no, changes, no. Um, that was way above my pay grade. Um, I worked for some excellent commanding officers there, and I worked for some who had a true hatred for mental health. 
and wanted nothing to do with hearing about getting cops help, getting cops treatment, which kind of get back to work or write your summons is that, that kind of mentality. Um, that's so far above your pay grade. And there's so many levels of supervision above you at that point. There's just no way to make organizational change or procedural change. Um, the powers that be at that time weren't interested in it. Um, they wanted status quo. And in, in 2014, through a set of circumstances, that's probably something that would make a good like law and order episode or something like that. Through a set of circumstances in 2014, a position working with a, a peer support program within the department, a position being liaison to a peer support program opened up a vacancy that I thought would never open up. Um, it opened up unexpectedly. And so I put in for that position being the clinical liaison to this peer support program. And I ultimately got it. And so from 2014 to 2018, I spent those last four years as the department's clinical liaison to this external autonomous peer support program, uh, monitoring the treatment of cops who were out on long-term sick receiving confidential mental health services. Um, if I have to say that anywhere I feel I did the most good in the department, it was those four years. But you still work for the department. You don't work for the peer support agency. You work for the department. And so you're still the department and you're operating underneath the department strictures and you can only do so much good as you can sort of gray area your way through it. Right. But ultimately you're still bound by the department and making decisions in the best interest of the department. With the growth of peer support and many more organizations seeing the importance of providing mental health resources. Am I understanding correctly, though, that the best option would ultimately be having a completely separate entity, not a, not a member of the organization, being the peer support and psychiatric fitness for duty evaluations? You know, so the... So fitness for duties are done a, a few ways, right? So some agencies like the NYPD have an in-house fitness for duty unit. Other agencies that don't have the funding or the resources for that, they outsource their fitness for duties to a private practice that does that kind of work, right? Um, but that private practice ultimately is still an employee or, or a contractor of correct the organization. Yeah, there's, there's, there's really, I, I mean, not that I know, there's really no way to do it that gets around that, right? Ultimately, the person paying the bill, the person sending the referral is the client. So if the agency is paying or, or, or the municipality is paying that, they're the client. The municipality is still the client. You know, granted, the psychologist doing the evaluation is going to do their best to be neutral and, and, and unbiased and, and just do their professional due diligence. But ultimately, their client is still the agency um all things being correct in a just world where people do their job ethically and justly we can trust that the professionals are going to do the best by their client and in doing so hopefully the best by the officer as well but still ultimately you know in, in mental health we we're very risk averse in mental health mental health is a very very risk averse field for good reason right because we're risk averse and because we have as, as the agency is our client, that means that we have an obligation to public safety and an obligation to the safety of the workforce. We have an obligation to make sure we are not putting back on the street an unsafe and an unwell police officer, right? We're creating a recipe for disaster if we give a gun and a shield back to somebody who's mentally unwell and send them back into the street. We're also putting the rest of the workforce in danger if we do that. So it's not just about, well, they're my client, therefore I owe them priority. It's also about you have an obligation to public safety. You have an obligation to the safety of, of, of the workforce. Because of all of that, in mental health, we are on the side of preferring false positives over false negatives, right? We prefer, if, we're gonna, if I'm going to be wrong, Right. I would rather identify that risk exists 
when in fact I'm wrong, and no risk existed, than saying no risk exists and be wrong and risk exists. I would rather, and it's the same way of looking at pre-employment evaluations. They're all risk assessments. Ultimately, these are all risk assessments. I'm going to make a determination about what degree of likelihood exists that a negative outcome will occur if I make this decision or this decision, right? And I'm going to look at all the data points, but ultimately, in some way, I'm still making a discretionary call. I'm still saying yes or no. If I'm going to be wrong, I would rather be wrong saying risk exists when no risk existed than saying no risk exists and in fact risk exists. So we're always in mental health doing assessment work of this kind. You're always going to go 51%. I'd rather do a false positive 49%. I'd rather come in a false negative because there is an obligation to your client, but also an obligation to public safety and to the safety of the workforce. When you were coming towards your retirement, was your plan immediately to open up your own business? No, I, I had, I had no intention to retire whatsoever. I, I didn't want to retire. I, I loved, I loved my job. I loved what I did for a living. I loved, well, I loved coming to work every day. I loved my job. I I loved what I did. Uh, There was a particular supervisor who had a real distaste for mental health. Um, And unfortunately, the supervisor was in charge of the entire kit and caboodle. Um, Had no love for the peer support program um, that I was liaison to. Uh, pressured me to do things that are frankly not only unethical but illegal. Um, I wouldn't do those things. And the target on my back grew larger and larger and larger every day. Um, Bosses don't want to be told no. But sometimes the answer that keeps you safe and me safe is no. And if I say yes, I'm making both of us, (laughs) putting both of us, in an awful situation because not only is it unethical, frankly, it's illegal and I'm not going to do it. Weren't interested in hearing that answer. And so over a course of two years, um, they made my life extremely, extremely difficult. Um, They very slowly chipped away at everything they could do to me that was fully within their control that the union would do nothing about. Um, I went to the union, I went to other people, they would do nothing about it. The answer was, well, the commanding officer is God. In their own command, the commanding officer is God. So if they want to change your tours, needs of the department, they're changing your tours. They want to change your days off, needs of the department, they're changing your days off. They want you back out in uniform, working details three or four days a week, needs of the department, you're back out in uniform, working details three, three, three or four days a week. They did everything they could to just grind me down um, over, over two years. And my quality of life was severely diminished. Um, Frankly, my attitude changed. I just started becoming discouraged with the whole thing. Um, I had my degree. I was over. I think the worst thing that happened to me in my career was making it to 20 years. Once I had my 20, I'm coming to work because I choose to. Right. I hit 21 years and I was miserable miserable, absolutely miserable. Not because of the work. I loved, loved doing my job. I loved helping cops. I loved all of that. I loved everything about what I did. I hated coming to work every single day um, because it was just going to be another day of torture. It was going to be, okay, how, how, what are they going to do today? What, what's going to be their new way of punishing me today for making ethical, legal decisions, right? Um, I, I came in on a... Friday, I think it was. I had um, in the NYPD, we call time off slips 28s. So you, you put in a 28 and the boss signs it and you can block out those days as you're approved to be off. I had a, uh, an international trip um, coming up in September of that year. It wasn't a trip that was planned for the year before. So it was not my vacation pick. If it's your vacation pick, you're basically guaranteed you're going to get that week off. It was not my vacation pick. So I submitted the 28th months in advance. They signed the 28th, which meant I would have that time off. I planned an international trip with my wife and I uh, for that week. And it was probably three weeks before the trip was going. 
I came to work on a Friday. The NYPD does everything bad on a Friday. <laughs> they do everything bad on a Friday, right? And then they dip out for the weekend and they just leave you with that. I came in on a Friday. Now, so we, one of the changes they made, it used to be, so my, at the time my office was in a non-departmental facility in order to maintain confidentiality and, 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 and you know, increase confidentiality. One of the changes they made was, yeah, that's nice that you have this non-department facility office. We're going to do something different now. You're going to come to Queens. You're going to sign in in Queens. Then you can get on the subway and you can go to your office. Then you can come back to Queens and sign out in person in front of us in Queens. That was one of the many things they did to just continually make my life difficult. Um, so I showed up on a Friday. Where was your working office? Uh, in John Jay College, actually, in Manhattan on 59th Street. Um, which they could show up whenever they want. They did. They would right. frequently show up and check up on me. The integrity control officer showed up frequently. And every time they showed up, you know where I was? Sitting in my office, right? Um, this Friday morning in particular, uh, September 2018, I show up and the sick desk supervisor who I would sign in in front of hands me a notification slip, right? They wouldn't even do it themselves. They're so spineless. They wouldn't even do it themselves because all these folks are spineless, right? They wouldn't even do it themselves. They give the sick desk supervisor a notification slip to give me. I get it. And it's for, it's, it's for the UNGA detail, the United Nations General Assembly detail. And they're like, yeah, your 28s are canceled. You're not going on your trip. You're going to be on UNGA for the next month. And I said, okay, thank you. I signed the slip. This was a Friday in the morning. I went to my office. I sat and I thought about stuff all day. Saturday morning, the day after, I came in, I packed up my entire office, told them nothing, packed up my entire office, drove it home, went back to left rack, emptied out my locker. Monday morning, I walked in with no plan, no forethought, no intention that I was going to retire. And I threw my discontinuance of service on their desk and said, sign it. You want me to sign the slip? You sign that slip now. And I walked out and that was it. I left. How hard was that decision? In my anger at the moment, it was not hard. Um, it was, I've never looked back, right? In that sense, I do not regret doing that. My only regret is that I didn't spend two or three years padding my pension so that I would retire with the maximized pension I could. That's my only regret. Right. My only regret is my financial situation. Right my selfish financial situation. That's the only thing I care about in my decision to have walked out, that I didn't milk this city and that job for every sense I possibly could for the rest of my life. That's the only regret I have about that decision. Leaving that job and throwing that piece of paper in their face and walking out of there, no regrets. Not to pour salt on the wound, but have you maintained contact with anyone and have things gotten better within the organization? Had you, if you were still doing it today, are there things that are better or would it still be a lot of the exact same old ways just today at 2023? Things have changed since I've left. Um, I maintain no contact with anybody in the department whatsoever. Um, I have no desire to. Uh, anybody I want to keep contact with is retired already. You know, and I keep contact with those people. Um, Every now and then, extremely rare occasions, I'll have a conversation with Greg Mack, who was, who was a friend on the job, and now he's a deputy director at Psych. Every now and then, we'll have a conversation, you know, um, nothing in depth. Uh, but since I've left, a few changes have happened. I hope they're for the best, ultimately. The, the, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist wearing the robes of a pessimist, you know. I like to believe things have changed. But the feedback I get from my therapy clients who are still on the job would speak otherwise, right? Now, granted, it's a select pool of people, but the feedback I'm receiving from my clients, the things I hear in session that are still being done to them, it leads me to believe not much has changed other than on paper. So since I left, the agency created a, a health and wellness unit um, that's supposed to be really in charge of health and wellness as opposed to like fitness assessments and things like that. The department has created its own internal peer program. I'll, I'll keep my opinions on that to myself. Um, 
you know, things have been done there. The director I worked under when I was at psych, uh, was really forced off the job. Um, and there have been two directors since, you know, that I believe are making changes for the better. I like to believe they're making changes for the better, but the feedback I received from my cops and client in therapy would tell me otherwise. I still see the things being done that were being done back then as well. I guess I was thinking maybe in a perfect world, if, if there had been change at the administration level, would there be any, any type of olive, olive branch reach out to you and at least to just get your input on what positive changes could be made? And nobody reached out to me. When, how soon after you retired, did you hang your own shingle and start doing your own? Um, th- that Monday that I threw the papers on and walked out, I started planning that day. I had my articles of organization done by January, which was to create my PLLC. Um, spent two months trying to find the right office space. I didn't want anything. I didn't want to be in a large group practice. I didn't want my cops sitting in a waiting room and having their name called out in front of 15 other people. I didn't want that kind of setting. I wanted a maximum confidential clinical space, something nondescript, something no one's going to notice cops coming or going, no big giant psychological practice sign on the door, anything like that. Um, Took me about two months to really find the space that I really wanted. Um, Found it really by mistake, kind of by chance I found that. Uh, February 14th, 2019, I opened. For you and what you want to get out to the other first responders, for those who might be especially... I'll put it in our generation, the older generation who might be skeptical or averse to going and talking to someone outside of being ordered to go talk. What advice would you give for them that might kind of alleviate some of those apprehensions or concerns about going to talk to a psychologist? I think people have a fantasy of what therapy is like. You know, I think people who've never, who who have no entree into the mental health world, especially cops, right? I think they, I think number one, I think they have a fantasy of what therapy is like. Um, I think they have this fantasy that there's no way that they're, I think, first of all, I think that I'm not a big advocate of the relatability argument. I'm not, I'm not a big advocate of the idea that my therapist has to understand my life have lived my life experiences in order to effectively treat me. I'm not a fan of that relatability argument whatsoever because I've seen it not be true, right? Meaning that if we follow that logic to its nth, right? I can only be seen by a treater who has lived my life experiences. Let's follow that all the way to the end of that logic. That means the only person who can be your therapist is Is you. Is you. How's that worked out so far, right? So throw that relatability argument in the garbage, right? I do not believe, yes, cops come to see me because I was a cop, right? I don't believe cops need to see therapists who were cops. Like, I just don't believe that. I think there are extremely effective therapists out there who were never in law enforcement whatsoever, right? I think the bigger fear is this person I'm going to sit down with, I don't know their for example, political affiliation. I don't know what they think about cops. I don't know if they can handle the stuff I'm going to say. I don't know if this is a knee jerk person who the second I say anything, they're going to be, you know, calling the ER or calling my department or whatever it is. I, I just don't know. I don't know. I can't trust this person. So I think cops pick people they can, they believe they can trust Not so much they might be a good therapist. Not so much I might get better. I think I can trust this person, so I'm willing to give it a shot. I had. um, Is that more human nature than police nature? Because aren't we are all of us kind of drawn to who we perceive as closest to like us? We are. I think the issue comes again. Primary instinct is self-preservation. 
that is the primary instinct in, in human nature, self-preservation. I will protect myself at all costs, and then I'll think about anything else, right? I will survive first, and then I'll think about anything else. So primary instinct is self-preservation. That the idea of putting myself into an unknown and not being certain whether or not this person is going to have advent career consequences to me. I don't know what they're going to write on that piece of paper. I don't know if they're going to call my job. I don't know if I can trust this. Putting ourselves in those kind of situations goes directly against self-preservation, right? So there's this feeling of, I need to know, yes, that the person can understand me. Like, I don't want to have to explain the job. I don't want to have to explain what I don't. And I also don't want to sit there and you want to hear war stories. Like, I'm not interested in any of that. Therapists have been known to sometimes say really stupid things to cops. Um, things that come out really judgmentally. Like, why'd you have your gun out? I don't understand. Like, it was, what, what do you mean you had your gun out? Like, they start questioning and right. second guessing your, 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 like, that's not why I'm here. I'm not here for you to after action my shooting, you know? Um, and so there's concern about judgmental attitudes towards police, towards use of force. To, and, and often, you know, the vast majority of my cops that come into treatment aren't even coming in for line of duty events. The job is a backdrop that's informing everything. They're coming in because of divorces and, and things like that. Now, granted, did the job inform the occurrence of the divorce? Possibly, but they're not coming in because of a shooting or because, some are. Right. I have a, you know, a pretty sizable uh, group that are, but a lot of people are coming in just because of life situations, right? But they don't want to come in for a life situation and then worry that somehow it's going to negatively impact their career by doing so, right? So I can't go here to try to make things better and then that person makes things worse. You know, I, I just, I, I can't risk that happening. I did a fitness for a cop um, years ago uh, and and the person finally got themselves into treatment and uh, and the cop had said, you know, I'm not sure that I want to get into treatment. I'm not sure that it's that it's safe, that it's really confidential. And his feeling was basically, I am less concerned about getting better than I am about nobody knowing I'm in therapy. He was more concerned about, I, I just, no one can know. So even if I go to therapy, I'm not gonna tell you, fitness for duty guy, because you're gonna try to get my records. I'm less concerned about getting better. And this guy's life was falling apart around him absolutely falling apart. His job was falling apart. His marriage is falling apart. I'm less concerned about getting better than I am about nobody knowing I'm in therapy, right? They, these are high stakes situations. Your average person going into therapy is not walking in there in a high stakes scenario, right? You're, 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 you know, you're, you're tradesman, right? Who has finally made the decision to go into therapy because he's on an ultimatum from his spouse or something like that. There's no high stakes scenario. They're not going to lose their job because they went into therapy. They're not going to lose their pension because they went into therapy and said something to the therapist, right? Your, your average cop thinks they are, right? Now, that's fantasy. It's not true. 90% of the time, it's just not true. But, but they, they, they believe it is. The other, the other issue, one of the big barriers to treatment for cops is that they perceive, cops for the most part, perceive mental health professionals as adversaries, the average person walking into a therapist office is not seeing the therapist as an adversary, right? Cops are because the first one's the first time most cops, not all cops, when's the first time most cops ever have an interaction in their entire life with a mental health professional, the pre-employment psych. And what is that pre-employment psych person trying to do? Keep you from getting the job you want. Adversary. When's the second time potentially a cop will ever see a mental health professional in their life? Fitness for duty evaluation. What is that fitness for duty evaluation trying to do? Take your job away from you, right? They perceive cops as adversaries. And so uh, they, they perceive uh, mental health professionals as adversaries. So even going into a therapist office with it, where you're now the client, this is your therapist, in their mind, this is still an adversary. This is a person who can hurt me. And so I have to walk in very, very carefully. Along those same lines, though, doesn't that play into, and, and I've heard this said, once you cross the bridge, it's time to go talk to somebody, be open to the fact that just because you don't connect with the first person, that all therapy is bad. Hey, I, this one didn't work. Try another one. Don't give up on the therapy simply because 
of how you perceived the interaction with them. 100%. 100%. Again, most people don't, don't really know a lot about the field of psychology or the field of psychotherapy or about how therapy works, right? Most people don't realize like, okay, so maybe you're going to see a therapist, but what's that therapist's theoretical underpinning? Are they a cognitive behavioral therapist? Are they humanistic? Are they psychodynamic? Are they a mindfulness skills-based therapist that's just going to teach you mindfulness skills, breathing techniques, guided imagery, these kind of stress reduction uh, things? Are they uh, EMDR therapists who pretty much all they do is, is, is EMDR therapy, right? People pick a therapist because they're in their in-network with their insurance carrier, um, because they're close to their house. I mean, in the day of Zoom, it's a little bit different, right? But people pick therapists many times for the wrong reasons, Right. Um, and then they walk in and after three sessions, they're like, yeah, I'm not doing this. Right. Um, but navigating the mental health field is not easy, right? Navigating the mental health system is not easy. Most, m many therapists have moved away from being in network with insurance providers completely. Insurance reimbursement is a nightmare. It is a nightmare. Um, I do my own billing, you know, I, I, I take, I take insurance. It's a nightmare. Um, they deny you, you know, I'm a sole proprietor, right? I'll get denied a claim. I got to sit on the phone an hour and a half on hold. It's an hour and a half of my time that I'm sitting on the phone waiting to get $65 paid out to me by an insurance company. It's a nightmare. So what do most therapists do? They just don't take insurance. I'm not going to take insurance. What I'll, what I'll give you is a bill and then you can go submit it to your insurance company. You can get reimbursed. Why should I get reimbursed? Right? So People pick therapists for all the, I'm going to pick this therapist because they take my insurance. That's the first question I often get. Do you take my insurance? Why is that your primary concern? <laughs> do you want to get better or, or do you want to save money? Like I'm not, I'm not, you know, like which if, if I was, I, I just don't understand. Like I understand, listen, I get it. People aren't millionaires, right? But if the first question you ask a therapist is, do you take my insurance? You're looking at it completely the wrong way. You're not interested in getting better. You're interested in, in not spending money, right? And so that should not be the first question that people are asking therapists, right? They should, they should want to understand the therapist first, understand how they operate. What's their school of thought? Have they worked with cops in the past, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but often what drives people to pick a specific therapist is often asking the wrong questions. Play devil's advocate, though, if somebody is apprehensive about going to talk to somebody and that first instance, that first step off, maybe if it is covered by their insurance would be a, a greater lessening of the barrier to getting into it because now there isn't the out of pocket expense. So I could right. I could kind of see both sides of the coin, but ultimately I agree with the, the way you said it best. If your first question is whether or not you take my insurance, then is your motivation really about trying to improve what is impacting you? Right. You know, because the who you are and what is best for you and your family, you can't put a price on that. Correct. Especially those of us and what we've experienced doing this job. And and I don't and, and I'm speaking as someone who does not take private pay. I, I have no private pay clients at all. Um, I only take insurance reimbursement, meaning I don't take anything over reimbursement. Some therapists will tell you, well, look, my, my rate is $225 a session. Your insurance provider pays 80. You, you, you'll pay me cash the other 145 and I'll take the, I don't do any of that. I take no private pay. I, I, I take only what the insurance provider gives me. Finding that out there, that's a unicorn. You don't, right. you don't, you don't find that out there, you know, um, but, you know, and again, this is sort of a tangent, but I often have conversations with my colleagues in the realm of police psychology or first responder psychology. And sometimes I'll say to them, that's, that's interesting. I'm trying to understand, are, are you running a practice or are you operating a business? I really can't tell. I thought you were a therapist, but it sounds like you're a business person at this point. For me, it's not a business. My business model is the worst business model out there. Um, I provide a service nobody wants. Uh, my goal is to get people out of therapy, right? 
uh, and I don't do it in a way that's particularly lucrative, you know. So uh, it's probably the worst business model out there, but not all my colleagues follow that. Some of my colleagues see, see it as a business model. I've heard of EMDR, and I've actually interviewed a couple guests now who have done the the process Mm -hmm. and they've spoken of it highly what's what does it involve in is that something that you do i do yeah uh so emdr stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy it's it's a long name that probably if if the originator of it francine shapiro could look back she'd probably name it something else because it's just too long of a too long of a title um, so it's, it stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. When it was originally created, it was thought to be primarily a trauma focused therapy, but it's really much more than a trauma focused therapy. It's effective for a wide range of, of diagnoses. Um, so the origin of it is, uh, Francine Shapiro, she's passed away, but she has a couple of books that tell this story. Um, the origin of it is she was sort of out and about and having some troubles and she was watching either a badminton match or a tennis match or something that a ball was going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as she was tracing it with her eyes, she found that afterwards she felt much better than she had previously. And so it launched her into this exploration of why that might be. It's just like a thing. Um, So EMDR is a way of using what we call bilateral stimulation, meaning moving the brain from one side to the other, back and forth repeatedly, in the beginning specifically with the eyes. What EMDR is replicating, and do we fully understand the mechanics of why EMDR works? No, I, I wouldn't say so we have theories about why it works. Do we really actually tell you, can we tell you specifically why EMDR is effective? No, we actually really can't. What it's doing is it's making the brain move back and forth, back and forth across the hemispheres, okay? Similar to what goes on during REM sleep, right? So during REM sleep, your eyes are doing this right? They're moving, they're going back and forth. EMDR replicates what goes on in your brain during REM sleep. During REM sleep, your brain is sorting through memories and images and facts, storing them, processing them, whatever it might be. In EMDR, what we do is we, we have the person hold a particular negative thought that they have and a memory that's associated with that negative thought and an image that's kind of the thumbnail image for that memory we have them hold all that in their mind at once and then we begin bilateral stimulation which is either done by moving the person like this back and forth uh sometimes there's a little bit of an angle we can do it with a light bar but it's just a light on a bar that's going back and forth and you're following that sometimes we do it with tapping like this or like this or tapping on the knee there's different ways that there's these um vibrating things you can hold in your hand vibrates back and forth either way it's a way of creating bilateral stimulation at some point somebody asked well if emdr works can can blind people do it right and that was like well maybe there's a way to do it without using our eyes right so that started all this other research about tapping and all this other kind of stuff um the idea is that when when certain negative memories are stored they're improperly stored right because there's a lot of emotions tied to them and so they've been stored in an emotional place in the brain. And that's not where they belong. They belong and store, stored and encoded in a more logical uh, place of the brain. You want to break up that memory from, from a big chunky memory. You want to break it up into its granular pieces so that the brain can then properly store those where they belong. EMDR is not about erasing the memory. It's about separating the memory from the emotions that come with the memory. So you want to separate all the emotional material from the factual material of the memory. Um, And by doing so, the person can revisit the memory without the emotions that come along with it. And then the other piece is installing. So after we've broken up a negative memory, we want to install a positive thought in replacement of the negative thought that was previously there. I'm not good enough. Um, I'm a bad person. Whatever the negative thought is, we want to replace that with a positive. So once we've broken up that memory and that thought, we then want to install a positive thought um, in, the, in, in its place so that when you revisit that memory, the positive thought is affiliated with it instead of the negative thought being affiliated with it. 
the 30 plus years now that I've been affiliated with law enforcement and especially combining it with the veteran community, the number of suicides, the pure numbers have definitely increased. I've heard some explain that they're just mirroring society. Do you believe that? Or do you think that there is a, 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 an effective way that we can start working on reducing those numbers? To a certain degree, there, there, it is mirroring society's numbers and that, that we did see. So the CDC publishes this uh, report on suicides every four years. Um, up to now, it's been a less than perfect reporting system because the, the money for the funding of capturing the data was limited and only 18 states were being captured. So they, the CDC might report these many suicides happened this year. That's really only reported from 18 states, right? And so we have to wonder what makes any of those states, like are those states all with, with no large urban populations or only with urban populations? So there's a skew in that data. And it's only reported every four years. And by the time it's reported, the data is three years old. So in other words, the data that was reported in 2020 was really 2013 data, right? The one that's coming out in 2024, luckily, will now be all 50 states, including the territories. So we'll have a better number of raw data, right? Uh, but it's still going to go back three years. So the 2024 data will be 2021. 2021, right? So we, one of the problem, one of the confounds is we have old data that we think sometimes is current data. Like when you see the way it's reported, you think, oh, this is current. It's not current. It's usually years in the past, right? Um, so we have seen an uptick in society in regard to suicide numbers. We've recently seen a downtrend, um, but whether or not it's really a downtrend or whether or not there's other confounds in the numbers. Like, so for example, in 2020, um, suicide slipped from the 10th leading cause of death among Americans to the 11th. But what else happened in 2020? COVID happened, right? COVID just took the place you know, it, it was, it didn't exist previously. And now it was like top, it was like the sixth of the top 10 or whatever it was. So bumped suicide out to 11. But now that, now that the pandemic you know, was sort of wound down, suicide is probably going to creep its way back up because of that reason. So sometimes there's other things that we say. That I think the heartbreaking piece about suicide is that where we do see an uptick is in people 12 to 18 years old. That's, that's horrifying. I mean, it's absolutely horrifying, right? That we have... 13 year old kids suiciding out there, you know, because of whatever new demands society is putting on them, cyberbullying or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, so I do think we are seeing an uptick in society in, in, in general. Um, and when you really look at the numbers, you know, if you look at the CDC data anyway, which again is imperfect data, it would suggest that law enforcement is really, there are other occupations higher than, than, than law enforcement. But again, you're dealing with skewed data there. It's not real true data right um we had a we we had 2019 was critical mass for suicides in law enforcement it was the highest number we've seen in, in years and in years um but again the the tracking of that data is also imperfect right um what's recorded as a suicide what's not recorded as a suicide so for example currently we have um the law enforcement suicide data collection act right which is a federal uh, act that orders the FBI to begin tracking law enforcement suicide data the same way that they track LEOCA data, law enforcement officers killed in the line of duty data. So now we have LESDCA, right? However, what people don't realize, it's like the UCR, it's voluntary, right? No agency is mandated to report that data upstream. So sure, we have a reporting system. I think less than 1% of agencies in the United States have agreed voluntarily to report that data upstream. So are we really getting a picture through LESDCA of how many suicides are occurring in law enforcement and what changes and trends aren't now until we have a, a mandatory reporting system where agencies are mandated to report suicides upstream somewhere so that they can be captured, you know, in, in, in aggregate and analyzed. Uh, we won't really know the true picture. And the only other people really capturing data are sort of these um, uh, not-for-profit agencies do, doing their own thing. There's no government oversight. There's no real oversight into how they're collecting their data. And there's apples and oranges in the data. Some people are including retirees 
in their numbers. Some people are not including retirees. Some people are including, for example, correction officers. Other people are not including correction officers. So there's apples and oranges in the data as well, right? So while we don't have true data in regard to law enforcement suicide, we, we have some, some decent numbers being tracked that show that 2019 hit critical mass, and we've seen a slow tick down since then, but not down to the level I would love to see it at. So if I could... <clears throat> If I could give you the scepter and the wand or the scepter and the crown Mm -hmm. and make you be able to make changes in the first responder world from day one, the day you hit the academy, what what changes do you think you would implement to address long-term mental health? Yeah, so... um So one of the changes that I would implement, that I would make mandatory, and if I could do it nationwide, I would, is mandatory annual mental health wellness visits, okay? And let me operationalize that because people might think I mean something that I don't mean, okay? One day every year, every single cop in the United States is man, and by cop, I mean rank and file up up to the executive, right? Everybody is mandated to go to a therapist office, sit down in person in a therapist office and have a wellness visit. It's not a therapy session, right? You don't want to talk. You want to cross your arms and waste everybody's time. God bless. Cross your arms, play the fool, waste everybody's time. Sure. No problem. It's not a therapy session. So the therapist is going to be doing most of the talking. They're going to psychoeducate you about depression, about anxiety, about post-traumatic stress disorder, about psychosis. They're going to psychoeducate, psychoeducate, psychoeducate. They're going to make you aware of what resources exist should you want to, you know, see somebody in therapy or whatever it might be. It's going to be largely psychoeducative. It's going to have no evaluative component whatsoever. You're not going to be handed a symptom checklist. You're not going to be asked to fill out a a personality measure, nothing. None of that goes on whatsoever, right? When you leave, the only thing that gets reported back to your agency is that you showed up. That's it. This person showed up. Attendance is mandatory. Participation is not, right? You want to cross your arms. Like I said, play the fool for 45 minutes. Go ahead. Waste everybody's time. That's, That's fine. I would implement that as mandatory for every single law enforcement officer in the nation throughout their entire career. There are devil's advocates to the whole thing. There are people who want to who want to create it differently. I would suggest that some people have agendas that are built into how they want to see it done. It's a longer conversation. Um, but it's, I mean, I believe that what that does is demystifies the clinical space for cops right? All you're doing is sitting in a room talking to somebody. It's literally all you're doing, right? It's not this terrifying experience. No one's going to ask you to dig into your deepest, darkest secrets and reveal them. It's two people in a room having a conversation with each other, but it demystifies what it is to walk into a therapist's office and sit in front of another person and have a conversation about mental health, right? It also makes resources available to the person. It also gives the cop somebody they now know where they can reach out to and say, Hey, I think my kid needs a therapist. Do you know anybody my kid could see? Hey, I think my wife and I could, could use some marital therapy. Do you know anybody that that we could see? It now sort of gives you, you know, a person in the mental health system who's a point of contact who doesn't, doesn't represent your agency. And this is where chiefs get sticking points about this. Chiefs don't want to hear about this, right? Chiefs want to know where's the bang for my buck. If we're going to be paying for this, because the agency is going to pick up the bill, it's not therapy, so it can't be submitted on insurance reimbursement. It's not therapy. The agency is going to say, where's the bang for my buck? So hold on. I'm going to pay for all of this, and they're going to give me no feedback about how my cops are doing? Correct. Correct, Chief. No feedback whatsoever. Why would I pay for that then? Well, if that's how you're going to think about this, thief, I don't, uh, Chief, I don't know what else to tell you. you know. Um, but until higher-level executives buy in, to the idea that the way you stop negative outcomes is by getting in front of it from day one and mandating it for everybody. What value or 
component should, because you, you bring up a great point in the sense that, okay, so you go talk to a therapist and there's that perception of, I don't want to talk to, you know, in a, in a clinical setting, but with the growth of peer support, how important is it to grow that aspect of it, of those that they see as their peers, maybe from day one in the academy or something like that, mm -hmm. saying, it's okay to do this. This is how it's helped me kind of deal. Yeah, so I, I've been involved in peer support in, in various ways for about 20 years now, from doing peer work to doing you know curriculum and training development to being on a clinical referral network for people who go to peer support and it bridges them to higher level clinical services. Uh, I've been doing peer, peer, peer support work in the realm for, for years and years. I've seen it done. I've been involved in it at the local, state, federal, the national level. Um, national Fraternal Order of Police just finally um, got off the ground their Power and Peers program, which is a nationwide peer program. So some cop in a 10-person department in Alaska can call some cop in Florida, presumably, as, as a peer contact, right? I was involved in the advisory panel for, for development of, uh, of that of that curriculum. Um, there's great peer work being done out there because there's no oversight of peer work. There's no national standard for it. There's no there's best practices, et cetera, et cetera. But there's there's no national standard. There's no oversight out there. I've also seen awful peer support work being done out there, right? Because you can kind of design your program how you want, right? You follow a basic model and you kind of tweak it to your agency needs or whatever it might be. I'm a huge fan of peer support when it's done correctly, when there's sound clinical oversight in, embedded in the peer support program, a peer has a question, like, I don't know what I have here, right? Like you're on an arrest, you don't really know what you have, so you're calling the sergeant, same, same kind of thing. Like I'm meeting with this peer, but I don't really know what I have here, clinical oversight to bring in a clinician to say, well, let's, let's talk about this, right? When it has good clinical oversight and when it has availability as a bridge to higher level clinical services when it's not appropriate for peer support. Not every person who calls peer support has needs that are appropriate to peer support. Sometimes they need to be referred out to higher level clinical services. As long as that network exists and they can make that happen, sure, because we don't want to meet with somebody, open up a box and then be able to not do anything for them, right? So I, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of peer support. I believe that any attempt to really engage in wellness services has to exist along um, a range of continued care, right? From the lowest level of intervention to the highest. And I believe that there should be sort of lily pads along that, right? So um, training, right? Awareness and prevention training on mental health. That's sort of your lowest level. Right? We're going to do training and psychoeducation. Then peer support, right? You're not feeling right? Reach out to a trained peer. Have that conversation, right? Next level, a clinical referral network to be able to refer that person from peer support and in, in, into clinical care. Next level, established IOP and PHP programs out there that specifically serve the law enforcement populations, right? I think any good responsible wellness service should exist like that. It should be a continuum of care that moves along multiple places on this continuum where we can start from the least intrusive to all the way up to whatever needs to be done to help that cop. Um, and they should all be speaking to each other, right? They should all be interwoven in some way. Uh, but peer support, I'm a huge advocate for it when it's done properly, when there's sound clinical oversight and when it can be a bridge to clinical services when appropriate. From your time on the job to now solely focused on treating mental health patients, What's your advice for those that are on the job, especially those that are maybe a little bit more senior into their careers? If you could kind of break the stigma or, or get the word out there as far as what they might be experiencing that they're either ignoring, overlooking, you know, but that they need to address it. I, uh, a number of my clients you know, now and over the years are in some stage of recovery, right? typically alcohol, every now and then something else, but they're in some, some stage of recovery, right? They're either struggling to achieve sobriety or they've achieved sobriety. They're struggling to hold on to it or they've found sobriety, but relapsed or are maintaining sobriety long-term for years and years and years. They're involved in some stage of recovery. And many of them have said to me something that sounds like this. When I say, why now? 
your life has been falling apart for 10 years. Your alcohol has been destroying your marriage, it's been destroying everything for 10 years. Why now? What, what, what led you to walk in now? What's, what's the impetus, right? What moved you from what we call pre-contemplation to contemplation? Why are you here now, right? And often they'll say something like this, well, because I have a lot of yets, right? I haven't crashed my car yet. My wife hasn't thrown me out of the house yet. I haven't lost my job yet. I haven't killed somebody yet. But one of those is coming. I can feel it. I, I know it's coming and I have to get in front of the yets. I owe it to myself and I owe it to my family to get in front of the yets, right? Get in front of those yets, right? Not taking care of what's going wrong. It doesn't just get better. Like you don't just get better. Like it, it doesn't work like that. If, if you weren't feeling right, you'd go to your doctor. If he told you you needed to go see an oncologist, you'd go see the oncologist. You wouldn't be like, oh, my cancer will just get better. I'll just, I'm cool. I'm good. I'll just let this get better. It's not going to get better, right? There's nothing wrong with reaching out for some intervention. There's nothing wrong with reaching out for help. This is about the rest of your life. The job is going to be a drip in the bucket of your life, a drip. Cops often can't see that. They see the job, right? And even if it doesn't consume their life, everything about treatment becomes about the job. Oh, I can't have my, my, my partner find out. I can't have the job find out. I don't want to get my gun taken away from me. You're going to be off this job. Nobody's going to remember you. The day after you retire, nobody's going to call you. You think this job's going to check in on you 10 years after you retire, see how you're doing? No, you're a drop. This job is a drop in a bucket of your life. Stop focusing on it, right? This has to be about your wellness for the rest of your life, you know? Sure, hire to retire. I, I hate that concept, right? Hire to retire. I don't want to keep you well hired to retire. I want to keep you well until whatever the last day is that you draw a breath on, on, on this earth. And I want your relationship with your children and your family to be as best as it can possibly be. And I want you to be as healthy as you can possibly be because you, because you owe it to yourself and not for nothing. Everybody owes it to you for everything you've done and sacrifice yourself out there. You deserve to be well, right? You don't deserve to say, Oh, I, I don't want to do therapy. That's not something I would do. I'm a, I'm a strong cop. I don't talk to people. What is that? That's ridiculous. You know, take care of yourself because this is not don't that hire to retire business drives me nuts. Right. I don't want to see you well hired to retire. I want to see you well hire for the rest of your life. Right. And that starts now. That starts now with saying, I'm not right. Like, I'm not right. You know, other people are noticing it. My wife has said things. My marriage is falling apart. My relationship with my kids. I'm getting jammed up at work. I'm just, I know I'm just unhappy. I'm just unhappy. You know, let's talk. Like, what's the worst thing that happens? We sit down and talk. From the personal aspect to wrap this up, you getting any opportunities to still scratch that itch of wanting to evaluate the criminal mind? Uh, so not, no, I have, you know, it's, it's interesting. So it, as I said earlier, what prevented me, I did my internship at Kirby Forensic, which is up on Wards Island, the maximum security forensic psychiatric hospital. I loved it. It was an amazing experience. And my director at the time said, you know, we'd love to hire you. Are you interested in retiring early? Like, will you come back? And I said, I, I would love it. Let me go retire. What I later came to find out is that if you're drawing a pension from the New York state pension system, you can't work in, an, in a state facility that feeds into the same pension system unless you get what's called the 211 waiver, which allows you to do so. Certain people get the 211 waiver given to them. Often those people retired with the word chief in front of their name. The rest of us do not, unless you know the mayor or unless you know somebody up at the New York State Office of Mental Health that greases the wheels for you. I was not able to get a 211 waiver, right? The New York State Office of Mental Health said, that's impossible. Well, it's not impossible. It's impossible in this case, right? So I was not able upon retirement to do that. But the truth is, those eight years of working internally in the department and seeing what was being done to cops is, a, you know, that... There's a scene in Star Wars in, in episode four. There's a scene in Star Wars where Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader are about to go at it. And at one point, Obi-Wan Kenobi says to Darth Vader, strike me down and you will make me more powerful than you can ever imagine. I'm now more powerful than the department could ever imagine. They struck me down. 
and I'm doing more work, more good for cops than I ever could have done working underneath the strictures of that department. I know that. I know that I'm doing the most good in this world that I can do exactly where I am right now. Do I still get the itch? Like I've gotten calls from my mentor, Naftali. He's asked me if I want to come back and do some sex offender work, you know, for him and his practice. It's appealing. Um, it pulls me away from where I belong. Where I belong is doing therapy with cops. I'm good at it. I do good there. I'm more satisfied there than I've been probably anywhere working in my life. Um, and so do I get the itch? I do. I'm still very interested in it. You know, it's a clinical interest, um, but I know that I'm where I belong right now. Well, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you sharing your story. Yeah, thank you. I wish you all the best going forward. Thank you very much. I appreciate you watching. But before you go, if you like the video, please hit that subscribe button. Also, any comments are appreciated. Thank you.